January 1, 2007. Adam Air 574, a Boeing 737 with 102 people on board, is en route on a domestic Indonesian flight between Surabaya and Manado on a stormy afternoon. While navigating to its destination, the flight begins to drift off course. Air Traffic Control contacts the crew to give corrective advice, but the flight continues to stray from its normal course. The pilots are having trouble with their navigation systems and try switching modes when their displays go dark. The flight disappears from air traffic control radars, despite showing it at 35,000 feet just seconds earlier. Days later, wreckage is spotted in the ocean, but the airline does not want to pay for recovery efforts. Months pass and the mystery of Adam Air 574 deepens. What happened to this routine flight that ended up becoming the deadliest aviation accident involving a Boeing 737-400? And how did this accident get Indonesian Airlines banned from flying into the European Union for several years? Find out on this episode of Black Box Down. Hello everyone, welcome to Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris. Hello, Chris. Hi, Gus. That's a good tease. It's a little tease. Lots, lots of good questions. Lot, as, as, ju- as you would say, <laughs> it's juicy. It's juicy. <laughs> um, little peek behind the curtains. This is this is an unusual episode because we're actually recording this episode together. In person. <laughs> In person. I'm, gonna, I'm still going to not try, try my best to not look I'm at I'm not you. looking at you, Chris. <laughs> And not for the normal reasons. <laughs> Before we get started, of course, in a bit of normalcy, I do want to remind people to give us a follow on social media at Black Box Down Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we post all kinds of stuff on there that you may find interesting. For example, a map, a map. <laughs> showing you the route of this uh, this flight was supposed to take between uh, two islands in Indonesia. Yeah. So Adam Air 574, domestic flight uh, in Indonesia. It was on January 1st, 2007. So just a little over 16 years ago, almost to the day, actually. God, it's weird because when, when we started this, I was like, oh, that wasn't that long ago. But it, 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 yeah, yeah. No, it, it was it was a long time ago. Time. Uh, <laughs> the pas- <laughs> the passengers were mostly Indonesian citizens who were returning to Manado from Surabaya after New Year's Day. You know, yeah. Which just it makes me sad. Yeah. I, so when you said New Year's, I was like, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's unfor it's always unfortunate, but ex- extra unfortunate because people were traveling, presumably mostly for holiday. Yeah, yeah. maybe returning home. It's supposed to be just a two-hour flight carrying people from the island of Java to the island of Sulawesi. So I was curious. I, I I this got me thinking. Do you know? Do you have any idea how many islands make up Indonesia? Because we've talked about Indonesia before about how it's very mountainous. Yeah, uh, because it's mostly islands. And in my mind, I was like. Oh, I'm, I, before I tell you my, what my guess was, I, I want to hear what your guess is. Wow. Ge- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a warning. Geography is not my strong. <laughs> That's uh, fine. That's fine. I get lost in the parking lot here. You once uh, booked a hotel when we were, we were overseas in another country. You once booked a hotel in the wrong city. I remember Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, they shouldn't have cities that also have the same name as train stations. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um. In other cities, if the train station, if the, is the train station in that city, makes sense. This, Any, is, this isn't a train <laughs> podcast, Chris. <laughs> Wait, did I say train? Tra- yeah, train station. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. How many islands? Man, 112. Okay, that's a fair guess. My guess, I thought three to 500. Okay. Is what I was thinking. According to the CIA World Factbook, Indonesia is made up of around 17,500 islands. Whoa! It's a lot of islands. Oh my! Uh, of which about seven thousand are uninhabited. It's difficult to come up with an exact number of islands for Indonesia because a lot of, well, not a lot of, some of them only exist at certain times, like when the tide changes. Oh, secret islands! Right, like small islands. It's not like a big island like you normally think of, but there's lots of small islands. Of like I said, seven thousand are uninhabited. Man, that's that's crazy. Secret islands, so cool. Like. <laughs> like you want like a pirate adventure to start with a secret island. Yeah, it's like you can only dig up your treasure certain hours. Or, or when... that, yeah, that's where the that no, that's where the map, that's where the journey begins. That's where they discover the the, the map. Oh, the map. Yeah, it's hidden, secret secret island. island. Anyway, that's a lot of islands. <laughs> it's a lot. So Adam Air at the time was a relatively new airline. It had been founded in 2002 and started operations in 2003. So it had only been around for about four years. It was actually much. It was probably closer to three years if you look at the dates. Mm-hmm. And at this time, Indonesia was experiencing a rapid growth in its airline industry. And I think we've kind of touched on this in the past in some of our previous episodes. Yeah. This was that time when there were many low-cost carriers proliferating in, in Indonesia. And Adam Air was kind of trying to carve their own, their own little segment of the industry. They kind of positioned themselves a little above low-cost carriers, like between low-cost carriers and traditional carriers. They had like meal service and they had a very like 
flashy, sleek mm. look. It was like orange planes, like orange and green color scheme, like kind of really trying to stand out. They gave meals for is more regional though. Well, I mean, it was still like a two hour flight. Okay. You know? I don't know if they had a meal on service on this flight specifically, but you know, they were trying to do more than just very yeah. bare bones, low cost budget carriers. Okay. So I was curious about the name Adam Air, so I did a little bit of digging about that too. And it, Adam Air was founded by someone named Agung Laksono, who was the speaker for the Indonesian House of Representatives, and a woman named Sandra Ong. And the airline was actually named after Sandra Ong's son, Adam uh, oh. Suerman, who served, and he served as the CEO of the airline. Okay. So I was, I, I was yeah, curious. Yeah, like, well, it, it didn't sound like an Indonesian airline name. Mm. I mean, to me, I mean, but I also, I, I don't know, I'm not there's particularly, also like yeah. Lion Air, which we talked about. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're kind of all over, but yeah, it's like Adam Air. I, th- I just think it's like a very generic name. It's like, oh. oh for, it, yeah, at least for us in America. <laughs> well, for anyone, I, like Adam, I don't know, it's just kind of a. I think it's, it's such a common name. Yeah, that, maybe that's what I'm thinking of, common. Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, like Adam Brancola. You'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just, it's, it's weird. So this specific plane was a Boeing 737-400 uh, series. We talked about one last episode, right? Yeah, it was like a brand new plane at the time. Mm. Uh, I remember they had a problem with the engine vibration. Right. This is some years later. This is uh, 2007. Got that vibration thing. Figured they, they figured that out. Yeah. And uh, this flight was under the command of 47-year-old Captain Referee Agustin Widodo, who was a veteran pilot, had more than 13,300 hours of flying time. And 36-year-old... Yoga Susanto was the first officer who had 4,200 total flying hours. Widodo had about 3,800 hours with the Boeing 737, and Susanto had almost 1,000 hours experience with the 737. So these were not new pilots by any stretch of the imagination. They, they had plenty of hours, and specifically plenty of hours with a 737. That being said, I'm, I'm just going to get... <laughs> this, this is a little bit of a spoiler. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to say this because we've touched on this in our previous episodes about... Indonesian budget airlines, there were some questionable safety issues with this airline. Pilots had been known to have reported repeated and deliberate breaches of international safety regulations and aircraft being flown in non-airworthy states. Oh. There was, this was such a rapid period of growth in the aviation industry in Indonesia that there were lapses like this. It was, it was not a very safe time in that specific region for, for aviation. And when you, like, They'd been reports, anything specific that stood out as like, oh, that's a, that's a big no-no. I mean, there were, there were quite a few. Adam Air itself had also had a few questionable incidents, we can say. Before this accident, there was another flight the year before in February 2006 that basically kind of got lost. Uh-huh. Uh, and they landed on a different island they were intending to go to. They landed about 300 miles off course. Huh. So that's... That's weird. Kind of bad. Yeah. yeah that, that's not the kind of, you don't expect to get on a plane and then end up at an island 300 miles away from where you're intending to go. Yeah. You don't like the idea of getting lost on a flight. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, I mean, that's just one example, right? And that's specifically with Adam Air that, that had happened about a year before this. This plane uh, was equipped with two CFM 56 engines, had about 50,000 flight hours. And it was last evaluated and declared airworthy by the Indonesian Transport Ministry on December 25th, 2005. So a little over a year before. It was a two-hour flight scheduled to arrive at 4 p.m. local time in Manado. And everything was going fine as expected until the plane, like I said earlier, the plane just vanished from air traffic control radar screens. Nine days after the aircraft disappeared, wreckage was found in the water and on the shore along the coast near Parapare, Sulawesi. And then 20 days after disappearing from radar, the black boxes in the flight data recorder, Uh cockpit voice recorder, were located about 42 nautical miles off the coast of West Sulawesi at the bottom of the ocean at a depth of about 6,600 feet or 2,000 meters. So they located them. They didn't retrieve them. They knew that's where they were because, you know, these uh, the black boxes have um, locator beacons on them Uh that give off a signal for usually about a month, about 30 days. And, you know, there were attempts to recover the recorders, but... Those efforts were suspended because the wreckage was deeper than they had the equipment to get to. Oh. So they needed special recovery equipment that wasn't available in that region. So they had to kind of call off the investigation for a bit. Not available or too expensive? <sighs> so <laughs> th- 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 that's a very good question. It was not available in the region, so it was available elsewhere. The question then became who was going to pay for it? Mm. Adam Air agreed that 
this was something that needed to be recovered and found. But they said since it was in the broader interest of aviation to find out what happened, that the government should pay for it. The government said, <laughs> well, it's your plane and your crash. You need to pay for it. So they actually negotiated for a long time. I think the negotiations went on for about six or seven months. Wow. They didn't actually, re- this spoiler for later, they didn't actually recover those black boxes and then pull them out of the water until August, despite the fact this was a crash on January 1st, 2007. Wow. So is this, it sounds like it's Adam Airlines. Being, well, I mean, I'm sure they don't have a ton of money. The new startup, they're not a big airline. And they were like, I wonder if we don't pay for it, someone eventually will. Right. I don't know of many other incidents we've talked about like this where there's a protracted negotiation over who's going to foot the bill. And I think in the end, it ended up being $3 million, of which the Indonesian government paid $2 million and Adam Air paid $1 million. And that was only sufficient enough to pay for one week of search. Oh, so wait, and this was, so this was, they were arguing with the government, their yes. government, Indonesian the government. Indonesian government over who should pay. I was thinking that like, oh, they're trying to get like, I don't know, like a, a insurance or something. Yeah. Or something, or, 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 or what would be like a, a like a, the international civil aviation organization like or someone. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's between them and their government. If you think about it, like that's their government agency that's going to investigate the crash. Yeah. And, th- and that's the wild thing to me is a company running an airline haggling over $3 million is a lot of money, but you think about the amount of money yeah, it yeah. costs to run an airline, you would think that you would be able to, to pay I mean, for that. That's a, a planes cost. Planes cost way more than that. So much, yeah. Uh, but and, they were probably hmm. leasing their planes. Oh. We've kind of touched on stuff like that before. Anyway, I think we'll talk a little more about that further on in the, in the episode. Just, I think that's a really unique twist to this one. And like I said, the $3 million that they settled on in the end was only enough to pay for recovery for about a week. And luckily in that week, they, spoiler, they did find the black box. Yeah. So eventually, you know, when they recover this wreckage, uh-huh. You know, the, the wreckage gives them some clues as to what's going on, even before they can, you know, they begin investigating the black boxes. They're able to determine the aircraft disintegrated and was destroyed when it impacted the water at high speed at a very steep descent angle. Mm. And then wreckage, like I said, there was some wreckage that was found floating on the surface and that washed up on nearby beaches. And that wreckage did not show any evidence of pre-impact fire. There's no scorching on it, mm. no burns. So it's all little clues. Yeah. And that wreckage I was talking about, they, that, some of that was found nine days after the aircraft disappeared. Like I said, wreckage was found in the water and on the shore, on the coast there on the island. And those locator beacon signals on the flight recorders were heard on January 21st. And they, they were, their positions were logged. Uh, and like I said, they didn't have the appropriate equipment. So they just kind of wrote down where, where, where they heard the signal coming from. For the black box. Right. Okay. They pinged on January 21st. I assume that's before they went silent. That was the last like known ping. Correct. Well, once they have the location, you know, they just write it down. It's not, it did, you know, it did move a little bit just because of underwater currents and things moving. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, but it was still in the same general area when they got it seven months later. It's a little off topic, but I was curious, when a plane goes down, is there any, like the black box, are they like weighted to drop down straight in some way? Or or once they hit, like, I I don't know, like how, how much... Do they move around or float around versus sinking? And yeah, that's a that's a good question. I don't know enough to answer that, you know, like with a hundred percent authority and definitively. But you know, they are they're not like super heavy. You can pick them yeah. up, you know, and normally they're attached to, to other parts the of other the plane. Parts yeah, of it, yeah. So it's, I don't think there's anything especially dense about them on purpose. Maybe there is, but it's you know it's attached to everything else inside the plane, and presumably you can find large pieces that are broadcasting. A location signal. Yeah, and they would just go to the bottom of the ocean. Right. Not like, okay. And the currents on the way down are going to move them, so there is going to be some drift between where it impacted the water and where it ultimately settles. They were still pinging. They were still, they were on the ocean floor sending off the signal. The, fl- the ocean doesn't like impede it. Yeah, you can still hear it. Uh, you, of course, you need special equipment for that. Yeah. yeah. Hello? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, it's not just someone sticking their ear into the water. <laughs> and this was a, a big search effort you know it's the indonesian navy army air force there were police search oh. and rescue organizations singapore offered uh some the search for for, for the initially for the, right, the initially, plane yeah. and the wreckage mm-hmm. when trying to find survivors not mm-hmm. the black box right some aircraft from the singapore air force came along the united states navy ship mary sears using there were just tons of people looking for the wreckage and weather was decent at that time and you know eventually the U.S. ship, the Mary Sears, had to leave. Like, as time goes on, and as they realize they don't have the equipment for it, 
you know, everyone who's, who's pitching in to try to find it, they all eventually leave and disperse. Once, you know, they, they know where it is and they know they can't get to it without that special equipment. Salvage operation to recover the flight recorders eventually began on August 24th, 2007, mm -hmm. so some seven months later. And the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder were both recovered on August 27th and 28th, respectively. Like I said, they only yeah. had a week. So luckily they found it on the third and fourth day. And you're probably going to get to this. What was the last communication? When was that between the, between the plane and, and outside world? Not, not the black box pinging from the ocean. The last indication that the air traffic control had of uh -huh. the plane was at about 6.58 universal time. That is when the, essentially the target disappeared off of their off of air traffic control's radar screen. So it just disappeared and there wasn't like any... There was no mayday, mm. no nothing broadcast from the, from the plane. That's, those, are, those are the creepiest. Yeah, I think the last actual response from the plane to air traffic control was at about 6.54 universal time. Mm. That's the last time the, like the, the first officer responds to air traffic controller confirming a heading they're supposed to fly. But they were not, they were already off at that point. They were off at that point, yeah. Okay. That, that's kind of, yeah, it's kind of what I said at the very yeah. beginning. They were kind of going off course and air traffic controls reaching out to them, letting them know, and hey. they're, you know, trying to adjust. And then nothing. Then, yeah, nothing. Man, good mystery. Uh, yeah, re very, very strange, very mysterious. Yeah, I'd want to, I, man, I couldn't wait. I wouldn't want to be waiting six months to get that black box. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very frustrating because there's also, yeah. you know, we try to abstract these things when we talk about them. We try to talk about them almost you know, we try to introduce a little bit of humor and almost clinically in the discussion about it, but there were people on that plane. Yeah. You know, whose, whose loved ones are waiting. It's like, well, they don't know what happened. They can't, you know, have any recovery of their, their remains or their personal belongings. And you're waiting seven months while the airline argues with the government over who's going to pay to recover all the stuff. And it just seems like the longer you wait, the greater chance that something would get damaged or not recovered. Right. Of course. So... It's awful. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down. You may feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up in the way that you want to. Uh, working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. I mean, who doesn't want that extra little boost or extra little bit of help to help maximize their potential? And I, I think that therapy can really help you get in touch with your feelings, figure out what's going on, and unlock the best version of you that's possible. So if you're thinking of getting therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge if you want to. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can help get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash blackbox down today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash blackbox down. Once again, just go to betterhelp.com slash blackbox down. You just fill out a brief questionnaire. It just takes a few seconds. You get matched with a licensed therapist and get 10% off your first month. Switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if you want to. No obligation, of course. Thanks, BetterHelp. This show is brought to you by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store, count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You've got New Year's goals and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. You can skip the grocery store, take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your door. And if you're looking for an easy way to eat well and save money this year, cut back on expensive takeout and delivery and get started with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, affordable it is to whip up a restaurant quality meal right in your own kitchen. Just the other day, what was it? Uh, just like two days ago, I uh, put together a HelloFresh. Well, I put it together. They put it together and I made it. Uh, it, was a, it was a great spinach ricotta ravioli with like a cream sauce. Uh, all came together super fast. I think it all came together like in 25, 30 minutes. Super fast to put together. And when it was done, I got to eat it. And it was, let me tell you, it was awesome. It was so good. And I personally like it. At the end of the day, for me, dinner time, put it all together. Nice little project. Then you eat. Yum. So go to HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown22. Use code BlackBoxDown22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown22. It's BlackBoxDown22. Get it? BlackBoxDown22. Use code BlackBoxDown22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Last couple of years, it's been really easy to feel stuck in a routine of doing the same thing over and over again. You might be wondering, what else is there out there to discover? Here's a bonkers idea. Hear me out. 
why not try an e-bike? Because now bike riders of all abilities can experience the freedom of the great outdoors with electric e-bikes. They're fun, they're fast, they're foldable, they're great for commutes, things like quick store trips, longer outdoor adventures. Plus, electric e-bikes cost so much less than the competition. They've got quality feature pack models you can finance for as low as $133 a month. And electric e-bikes are packed with quality features like a bright LCD display, seven gear gearing, five levels of pedal assist, and a powerful removable battery. They're customizable and adjustable to fit your lifestyle. Electric's XP 3.0 covers up to 45 miles on one charge. It can hit speeds of up to 28 miles per hour. They've got the smoothest ride ever, even at higher speeds, thanks to added suspension, optimized gearing. Plus, you can add accessories like the Elite Headlight, Yep Seat, or a passenger package that'll hold riders up to 150 pounds. I've got electric e-bike. I find every excuse I can to use it. Uh, it's like, oh, i got to run to the store. Oh, no, got to get on my bike. It's super fast. Sometimes it's faster than driving just because you don't have to worry about parking. There's some popular restaurants around here. Anytime I want to go to them, I definitely take my bike because I can just lock it up right by the door. Don't have to circle the parking lot forever. Uh, it's fast. It's easy. Trust me, I'm, uh, I'm an out-of-shape slob, and even I love my electric e-bike. So get out there and make this year your most adventurous one yet with electric e-bikes. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E bikes.com. So eventually they did recover these black boxes. And, you know, when they play back the cockpit voice recorder, it reveals that both pilots were concerned about navigation problems. Uh-huh. Like we mentioned, they mm-hmm. were kind of going off, off course. And both pilots became preoccupied troubleshooting inertial reference system anomalies. And that's one of the onboard systems that kind of helps feed navigation data to the onboard computers. And they became preoccupied with this for the last 13 minutes of the flight with minimal regard to other flight requirements. So, what? yeah, for the last 13 minutes of a cockpit voice recorder, they're just troubleshooting this system. The system is just like a navigation system? Like, do they have other? Couldn't they just go by like the waypoints? Well, the, how do you find the waypoint if your navigation system okay. is broke? So this, they're like, their navigation system's real broken. Yeah. And, and do you remember what the other plane that I mentioned Adam Air did a year before? Oh, yeah, yeah. They uh, it landed they on, the wrong, on the wrong, wrong island. island. Seems like it's an... On, I'm not saying these two issues are related. It just seems like there's an ongoing pattern here where there's navigation problems uh, happening. And you said it got stormy. Yes, it was got, also stormy that day. And, it, and, and what was the, the light like? Where the plane was flying, they were flying through some thunderstorming weather. So mm. heavy rain, lightning, and thick clouds. So they're not able to see outside. So... You know, you, you would think, how can you get lost or how can you, it, when you can't see outside, you don't know necessarily if you're banking or if you're at a weird angle or yeah. what's happening, it, especially if you're, if you're not looking at your instruments because you're preoccupied trying to troubleshoot and fix something else. You can kind of see what's happening here already. And the number of navigation systems there are, like, I know there's like GPS. This is, was this before GPS? I assume GPS probably existed. It might not have been in, in this, this plane. plane. Okay. Yeah. So that there, there, it pretty, would have still been pretty new. So they would have been navigating off of the waypoints. Right. Almost entirely. Probably. Yeah. And, and they don't really have visual. Correct. So. They, can't, they cannot see outside. The, the way that, from what I understand, the way that this system worked at the time uh-huh. was that it was, a, it, it was a fairly precise system that could, you know, that they would start using from the moment they started pushing back at the gate all the way through when they landed. But the way that it worked was, it's a little antiquated to think about now, when they were parked at the gate, they would have to manually enter the coordinates of where they were starting from, where the coordinates of that gate into the computer system. Uh-huh. That way the computer knew where to start from and okay. would then track after that. So the fact, it, it was working fine at first. So you would track, but not in like real time or like... Yeah, in real time. So like, sort of like GPS? That's like sort it, of sort GPS. Of, but if you had to tell GPS your exact coordinates when you turned it on and where you started. Yeah, but but it, so it, that's just to locate you, and then from there it can figure out because it, it would know like oh we moved so many feet this way okay. we moved up like it could track huh. after the fact, but you had to tell it where you were starting from. Okay, I mean that's cool. Yeah, but I mean that's cool now. Now it's way easier. But yeah. okay, so they have a GPS. No, I wouldn't it, call it, it that. Okay. <laughs> they have a sort of GPS, but then they also so then that means they should also have the waypoints as as a backup. Right. Well, they this system tells them how to get to the waypoint. Oh, so this is using th- this system is still based off. It's like a a more refined version of using waypoints, like rather than like. Well, it, just, it, it knows like oh, this was our starting position. The next waypoint is thirteen miles in that direction and thirty thousand feet up or whatever. Okay, so it, it just kind of automates the older system of just like yeah, yeah they, It's not like they're 
tuning into a VOR. They're not tuning yeah. in and listening to a radio signal and getting. That's that's where I was yeah. in my head. What they were doing, and this is like a a slightly an upgraded night, version yeah. of that. Yeah. So they were still, you know, for, for the reference, they still do use VOR radials, and I believe at certain points they were tracking off of some VORs like that. But this system should make it a lot easier because it should tell them where yeah. they where heading they need to go to and where they need to be. And unless it goes wrong, unless it goes wrong, unless it goes wrong, in which case they would have been better off just using the old fashioned way. Right. Yeah. Or they would have been better off if someone flew the plane and they weren't both trying to oh, fix yes, it. Yes, that too. <laughs> <laughs> and the flight data recorder showed that the aircraft was cruising at 35,000 feet with the autopilot engaged and the autopilot was holding five degrees left aileron in order to maintain level flight. And that sounds a little counterintuitive. So it's like in order to fly straight and steady, it was having to turn the wheel a little bit to the left. And I'm sure you've driven a car before where it's like, oh, the, the suspension's a little off. Mm -hmm. like, to oh, yeah. go straight, you turn, the, you turn the, the wheel a little bit. Hey, every day. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the case with this plane. Like it wasn't holding the, the controls perfectly level and straight would have caused you to roll a little bit to the right. So the autopilot was compensating for that by giving it five degrees of left aileron. All constantly? Constantly. Okay. Did they turn off the autopilot? And well... What, not necessarily. What happened was, while they're troubleshooting this IRS system, they switched it to what's called ATT or attitude mode. Uh -huh. And when they did that, the autopilot disengaged. Mm. Mm. And they did this as part of the troubleshooting? They had to switch off the autopilot? Or did they... They did this as part of the troubleshooting. Okay. And what they're supposed to do is, when you switch modes like that, yeah. you're supposed to... The autopilot disconnects. You're supposed to manually take control and fly the plane wings level for 30 seconds because the system has to recalibrate. Oh. So autopilot turns off. I believe at this moment also some of their screens turn off because it's rebooting. Oh, and that's why their screens went dark. Right. I was like, this is like some movie scene where they go to the Bermuda Triangle yeah. type thing. Nope, they were just rebooting the system and they didn't know this was going to happen. And they didn't, and they were like, oh my God. Yeah, so then that causes another problem for them to start looking at and troubleshooting or perceived problem, I should yeah. say. And since the autopilot disengaged, remember I said that it needed to have a little bit of left aileron in order to maintain wings level. Uh -huh. That went away. So then the aircraft began slowly rolling to the right. Oh. And there was an alarm. There was an alert, an aural alert that's, that says bank angle as they pass through 35 degrees of right bank. But in that system that they had to hold steady for 30 seconds, that, that was to get the, the new autopilot? Well, it was to re basically... Like Recalibrate re the... Rebooting the navigation system or putting it in a different mode. Uh huh. And it needs a little bit of time to calibrate so that the autopilot can take over. Okay. It's like rebooting your computer. It's, it's a yeah. gross simplification, but it's like rebooting your laptop and getting scared when the screen turns off. It's like, <laughs> oh no, what happened? Well, <laughs> but not, rebooting. yeah, yeah. And the flight data recorder shows that that right roll was momentarily arrested a few times, but there was only one significant attempt to really take corrective action on it. There was never a positive and sustained roll attitude recovery. And to the point where even after the aircraft had reached a bank angle of 100 degrees, so this is over all beginning to invert. 90, yeah. 90 degrees would be sideways, like wings. Oh my, that's a lot. Up and down. Yeah. So they had reached 100. Wouldn't gravity start pulling on them? Yes. The nose started pitching down. Their nose pitched down 60 degrees. So they were banked 100 degrees with their nose pitched down 60. So for reference, nose straight down would be 90. Mm -hmm. Oh, so like more than halfway to no straight down to the ground that, and 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 starting to invert because oh their roll God. is at 100. And they, this just how quickly did that happen? Like from them, like fiddling with it, like, what, do we know the time period of them just slowly turning that way? Or did it like get faster and faster the more it started to bank? I don't know definitively how long it took, but I believe all of that happened within like all of this happened pretty quick because I think from the moment that they switched to attitude mode where everything started rolling to the point where they hit the water uh -huh. was only like six minutes. Oh, that, so that is real fast. Yeah, it's, it's pretty quick. And remember, they're at 35,000 feet yeah, in the air. That, yeah. And like I said, there was never any significant attempt to correct and level the wings out. And they never did that even before attempting pitch recovery. So normally what you would want to do there's, there's, there's something that pilots are trained to do called unusual attitude recovery, where when you can't see outside, for example, uh -huh. and you, know, you don't know what your attitude is, like let's say in this case you're 100 degrees banked and 60 degrees nose down, there's a very specific procedure you follow. Like in this case, 
you would want to, since you're pitching down, presumably, they probably needed to pull their power back, level their wings out, and then start pulling back. The important thing is leveling your wings out before you pull back. Because if you, if you think that you're pitched down, like in this case where they're rolled 100 degrees to the right and 60 degrees nose down, if they pull back to try to recover and pull the plane up... It's like rolling on its tail. You just enter like a really steep spiral. Yeah. Yeah, you pull back, then you just like... It's almost like water going down a drain. Oh, man. It just starts spiraling very tightly. Standard operating procedure, level those wings, and then pull back. Because otherwise, you're just really putting crazy amounts of stress on that plane. Yeah, and you can't... Because you, you can't level if it's not gliding. Right. right? Like, or, 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 you, 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 you can't... I know what you meant. You, yeah. <laughs> you can't glide if you're not in wings level. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, so they pulled back while banked like this. Oh, and the man. aircraft reached 3.5 G... So 3.5 times regular gravity. So whatever you weigh, multiply it by 3.5. And that's how you would have felt on that plane. The plane's speed reached Mach 0.926. So it almost reached oh, the speed of sound. My God, they were plummeting. Yeah, during sustained nose-up elevator control input while in a right bank. Yeah, they almost broke the sound barrier diving down into oh, the ocean. So when you said disintegrated, that was not, it was not an exaggeration. No, in fact, on the cockpit voice recorder... The report says that there's a thump, thump sound that's evident about 20 seconds before the end of the recorded data. Do you know any guess on what the thumps could be? Uh, like, I don't know. I don't want to say. It was the plane breaking apart. It was going way too fast and the forces being put on it were just oh, so extreme. Oh, you mean extreme. like before it hit the water Before even? it hit the water. It, was, it started, the plane started falling apart. Oh my God. And you can hear, like I said, you can hear the thumping sound on the cockpit voice recorder. And the flight data recorder indicated there was significant structural failure when the aircraft was at a speed of Mach 0.926 and the flight load rapidly reversed from 3.5 G to negative 2.8 G. Is there anything... Okay, so they, they messed up by not fixing their attitude, mm -hmm. right? Initially. Mm -hmm. They go into this spin. Is there anything they could have done at that point it's probably still recoverable up to a point. They were descending so fast, though. I don't know. They, it would have taken immediate, aggressive, corrective action. And even then, even if they had saved it, it might, that plane might not have been flyable ever again after the stress that they put on that airframe. But it, it, it was, I mean, that's pretty bad. Yeah. Well, how did they, did they, how did they not realize that they were, was that sideways? <laughs> like, how did they... I mean, that, that's visible. There aren't there. There are warnings going off. Even if, like, worst case scenario, even if all of their displays turned off, like we talked about, some uh -huh. of them did. There are standby instruments that don't rely on that. That they should still be able to look at, even if all the power's mm -hmm. off. They operate mechanically. They can look at. I think they just panicked. So, so the instruments went off. I wonder how long they were off. I, I don't think that was in the report. I can't say that for certain, but it should have only been about thirty seconds. Yeah, and so they panicked. They probably thought they were diving and just pulled back without oh, actually without looking even at the looking at the instruments. Right. So they were just like instruments went off, warnings are going off. They're they're feeling gravity. They feel a little weird. They're not sure what it is, and they're like, "We don't want to crash." Pull back, and they just pulled it back into a spiral. And we've talked about this in the past about how disorienting it can be to be in a plane, and mm -hmm. how you're like your inner ear, your sense of space and gravity get really messed up. So yeah, they probably felt, "Oh, are we? We're diving." Pull, pull, pull back and didn't realize. Right. You, you should always, they always need to verify with the instruments what it is that what's, what's man. actually happening, what, where, what the plane's actually doing before attempting corrective action. And I'm, I'm sure, as you can guess, this accident resulted from a combination of factors, yeah. including the failure of the pilots to adequately monitor the flight instruments, particularly during the final two minutes of the flight. Preoccupation with the malfunction of the inertial reference system diverted both pilots' attention from the flight instruments and allowed the increasing descent and bank angle to go unnoticed. The pilots did not detect and appropriately arrest the descent soon enough to prevent loss of control. Obviously, the inertial reference system going out should not crash a plane. No. Worst case scenario, they get a little lost. They talk to air traffic control, and air traffic control manually tells them vectors and, and, and tells them where they need to go and how they need to fly. What should have happened was the system starts acting up. One of them flies the plane uh -huh. and the other one runs checklists. Yeah. and navigates. Right. Or no, just tries to fix the problem. Remember, it, it's yeah. always aviate, navigate, communicate. Just fly the plane and one person just run the checklist. Instead, it was like both of them 
became preoccupied trying to troubleshoot and and no one was flying up. No one, no one was. And not even what, the autopilot. Not even that's about what was, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> that autopilot had even disengaged. This this doesn't answer your earlier question, but I see here now that the roll to the right was really slow. It was about one degree per second. Oh, so, so to get to what a hundred? That's all. A hundred, about a little over a minute sec- and a half. Yeah, and there were a couple of attempts to stop the roll rate. Uh, at 6.57 and 45 seconds, and again at 6.58, so 15 seconds later. But it was just very momentary inputs to kind of level things out, and then the plane just continued banking to the right. And as mentioned earlier, there was an alarm going off saying bank angle, bank angle. Uh, it occurred at 6.58 and 10 seconds, and that's an automated alert when the aircraft reaches 35 degrees of bank angle. Oh, so that, that was like a full minute yeah. of, of it going off with them not correcting it. Right. And again, they just kind of briefly try to level things like, out. And the, then oh, it's like, yeah, it's like, oh, this thing's complaining again. So it's just, they, it would, they, I guess maybe they listen to it twice and then maybe just stop paying attention to it. That's crazy. That's to just ignore. Yeah. It's like, oh, that thing you just, <laughs> the just warning keeps going uh, off. Right. <laughs> the thing that's, that's there to try to save them. And, and then even still they were ignoring. And then whenever, what, the, another warning went off that because they were pitching down. Right. They only fixed the pitch not it didn't right, try. they tried pulling back mm-hmm. and then the pilot began you know like we talked about like you just said right there actually began pulling back on the control column at first modestly commanding about 1.1 g and then as the aircraft rolled right through 60 degrees of bank angle the pilot began to steadily increase and pull back more while continuing to roll right oh so it seems like they, made- they started banking and then he started pulling back which increased the banking even more aggressively and tightened that spiral up. Yeah. And then the pitch attitude at that point was about five degrees nose down. And then it started increasing about 2.3 degrees per second down. And then reached about 60 degrees nose down at 658 and 50 seconds. So all of this happened, what do we say? The last time they gave corrective input was at about 658. So within 50 seconds or so, that's when they started, you know, they started rolling, pulling back, and then began, that was when they reached their extreme nose down and right roll attitude. So very, very quick. Yeah. And there was no evidence that either of the pilots appropriately referenced the flight instruments, which is insane to me (laughs) that uh, they're not looking at their instruments before trying to do anything. And you say before, like at all, at any time during trying to fix things? They were were just totally preoccupied. And remember, they were looking at this for the last, for 13 minutes, the last 13 minutes of the flight. Yeah. It's just boggling to me. Like I said, that unusual attitude recovery, even when you're getting like your private pilot license, that's something you train on. You know, you, you, you have like a, something that limits your view so you can't see outside the plane. You can only see inside. Your instructor will mess the plane up. You know, you'll be at like a crazy bank angle or climbing or descending. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he'll let go of the controls and just say recover. And you just immediately are supposed to bang. You're supposed to look at your instruments, determine what's happening, then immediately apply corrective action. When they do that, they... Is it one of those things where you don't look at your instruments and then they mess it up? Yeah, you, you, you can't see outside, first of all, uh-huh. and then they'll tell you eyes down and you like put your head down and close your eyes. And they'll just mess it up. And, and so then you have to diagnose and then correct. Yeah, all within like a second. In, in the private pilot, what you do is you immediately look up, look at your airspeed, and then determine, you know, with, from the airspeed, you can kind of guess whether you're climbing too much or descending too much. And then, you know, apply appropriate prow- power, level your wings, and then either you know, pull back or push. Man. So even from step one, before, even before you get your private pilot license, this is something you already start practicing, much less to the point where you know, these guys, like we said earlier, were experienced yeah. pilots, experienced commercial pilots flying commercial airliners. So speaking specifically to the human factors, the pilots of Adam Air 574 appear to be overly reliant on the onboard navigation system. And when they realized that they were having problems with it, they were twice given position information by air traffic control about radial and distance. Remember, I, we, we said that at the very mm-hmm. beginning, you know, air traffic control reaching out to them, trying to help correct them. And they believed that the number two IRS was malfunctioning. However, the problem with the number two IRS did not trigger the illumination of a fault light as expected by the pilots. You know, mm. it, it even says like in the quick, in the QRH, the quick reference handbook. So they were experiencing an error. They thought they knew what it was, but it wasn't behaving the way that their checklist said it would. So... They decided to use the IRS fault procedure in the QRH, even though the fault light had not come on. Oh. However, after moving the IRS mode selector to ATT or attitude, 
they didn't comply with the QRH requirement to fly the aircraft straight and level at a constant airspeed for 30 seconds mm. in order to yeah. recalibrate the system. So they started going through the checklist to try to fix it, but, but then... Didn't, fall, didn't right. actually follow it? Right. They toggled the system and then didn't do the next step, which is fly the plane straight. And could that have been just because they freaked out about the rebooting the computer shutting off? Maybe at that point uh, they got distracted. That maybe that diverted their attention or the What's slight going on? Role. Yeah. yeah. That it's like, oh no, now something else is happening. The pilots tried to directly input the heading after they changed the IRS mode selector to attitude. There was no evidence of an attempt to recover reaction by the pilots until the aircraft had rolled right and exceeded 35 degrees of right bank angle. And they got that alarm. And at that time, like we speculated, they may have been affected by spatial disorientation. Yeah. The pilot in command did not clearly articulate an appropriate distribution of tasks to be performed by the crew when there appeared to be significant IRS problem. This crew resource management, mm -hmm. one of our favorite topics. <laughs> As a result, both pilots became distracted by troubleshooting the IRS malfunction and did not control or monitor the flight path of the aircraft. Inappropriate upset recovery procedures were used, which allowed the situation to deteriorate until structural failure occurred and control of the aircraft was no longer possible. Even though the right number two IRS was switched to attitude, the pilot in command's flight instruments should not have been affected, including the standby ADI, that's like the attitude indicator, and therefore available instruments to ensure the safe operation of the aircraft. So yeah, that's, that's everything we were talking about. Even if this, this was switched and flight instruments did go out, there should still have been the standby attitude indicator, which shows them if they're banking and mm -hmm. if they're diving or climbing or what's going on. You know, that they should, his eyes should have been glued to that as he's yeah. flying the plane while someone else does, um, well, well, I should say the first officer does the checklist or troubleshoots or figures out what's going on. I'm just imagining car comparison. You're driving a car and you got the car that has that kind of pulls one way and you're like, well, we're lost. Let me see. And then you're like looking at the map mm -hmm. and like pointing it out and then the car's just drifting and maybe once or twice like adjust it yeah. slightly. <laughs> but then once it starts drifting again, just be like, no, no, I'm just going to focus on the map. Yeah, or imagine if you also have a passenger. Yeah. And instead of having your passenger look at the map, you're like, oh, you let me look at that too. And you're both <laughs> looking at the map. And you got the map up and you can't even see <laughs> yeah. out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very similar. I've got a, a, a chronology of the flight that breaks everything down. I think now this might go a little too in depth, mm -hmm. uh, but I do want to give like some broad overview points from it. Uh, these times, by the way, are all universal time. I believe if I remember right, the actual flight took off at about 1 p.m. local time. It was supposed to land at 4 p.m. Uh, local time. Uh, it's a three-hour difference, but it was landing at a different time zone. It was actually only a two-hour flight. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they took off on time right at 6, uh, that's 6 a.m. universal time. They uh, took off. They were instructed to turn right to a waypoint, climb to 33,000 feet. They get passed off to a different controller. They get passed off to a few different controllers. And then uh, uh, about almost half an hour later, at 629, the air traffic controller says to himself, he doesn't broadcast this. He says, where is Adam direct to? My God, he's flying north. So he, this is when he starts to notice that they're off course. And he contacts them and, you know, he begins giving them appropriate directions. Say so he's flying north is in the plane? Yeah. Okay. This, you know, like we, like we mentioned, they, yeah. they're, they're, their system's messed up and they're, they're, they're drifting. They're having to get updates. And then the last bit of information that you asked about earlier was at about 6.54 and 30 seconds, the co-pilot responds to an air traffic controller. The air traffic controller gives them uh, a heading to fly on. And at 6.54 and 30 seconds, the first officer responds, confirming it, the direction they're supposed to fly. And that's the last transmission that's heard from the plane. So this is less than an hour after takeoff. 54, they're about yeah. not quite halfway there. Well, should have been. And then a few minutes later, at about 6.59, there was a shift change in the air traffic control tower. So the oh. person, yeah, that, that it's not, doesn't cause the accident, but you could, this Compounding kind of. Compounding factor. Right. It kind of can explain why things don't get noticed for a while because the radar blip on the screen disappeared at 658. And then one minute later, there's a shift change. Oh. So it's, it's terrible timing. It's just really bad timing. So, so the, the blip is in, that's whenever they went down. Well, the, the target. So it, it, it's, so to, to say it disappeared is maybe an oversimplification. What happens on the radar screen is that it's no longer getting a secondary radar return. So instead, it switches modes to where it shows the plane's flight plan on the screen instead. Oh. And that happens at 658. And then at 659, there's a shift change. And then it's not until 709 that air traffic control tries to contact 
the flight again. 709. And, and they don't get a so, response, right? So presumably 11 minutes later, after the crash, maybe. Yeah. And they don't get a response. Then they don't hear anything. So they tell them their radar service is terminated and they, they switch them over. They tell them to contact a different air traffic controller on a different frequency. At seven, this is... At 709. So, okay. And the other controller doesn't hear anything either. So they start asking other aircraft in the area to try to make contact with Adam Air 574 in case maybe there's a radio problem. If someone closer might be able to communicate yeah. with them. There's, you know, another flight tries to contact them at 716. They don't have any luck. And they, they ask a bunch of other planes in the area. Nobody can get in touch with them. And finally, at 815, they declare a potential emergency. At 908, they declare an alert. And then finally at 924, that's when they really start mobilizing everything. Yeah, so like, it, it, they, they, they clearly, something's gone wrong. I just, think, I just think, you know, we talk about a lot of things, a lot of the small contributing factors that add up. And I just think that shift change was at the it's, worst it's possible so, time. And it, does, it didn't cause the accident. But it definitely, like, added to the whole confusion. I mean, granted, that would not have saved the plane in right. any way. Right. But it would have made the recovery or the, the determination that something was wrong way easier. Maybe even the search area. Right. Right. Because they would have, they could have been like, hey, where are you? you know, like. Yeah. And that's one of the ways that they did actually narrow down the search area was they looked at the last radar return on that screen. Like I said, when uh -huh. it switched. So they uh, saw. Modes. So they, they, there, was a, there was a record of it. But maybe someone could have reached out or there could have been more prompt communication. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the NTSC is the, the investigation committee in, uh, in Indonesia. They're the ones who headed up this, this investigation. And the NTSC determined that Flight crew coordination was less than effective as the pilot in command did not manage task sharing and crew resource management practices were not followed. We've talked about that's like the biggest safety breakthrough ever probably is crew yeah. resource management and they had almost none. The crew focused their attention on troubleshooting the inertial reference system failure and neither pilot was flying the aircraft. After the autopilot disengaged and the aircraft exceeded 30 degrees right bank, the pilots appeared to have become spatially disoriented. The Adam Air syllabus of pilot training did not cover complete or partial IRS failure. The pilots had not received training in aircraft upset recovery, including spatial disorientation. They hadn't? They had not. So that's a big oversight. But that's, I thought you said that that's like... It's something that private pilots might learn early on, but they hadn't had recurring training on okay. it, like so specifically might, on that plane. So they might have, yeah, had that way back I when, mean, when they were, but then forgot. they'd been flying flying commercial for so long and they didn't have that right it's like recurring yeah. training to make sure it's something you still remember and still know muscle how to memory do. reflex mm -hmm. thing versus yeah having to think about it so the pilots were faced with an inertial reference system malfunction which with crew action rendered the number two eadi inoperative the left eadi and standby adi for attitude and direction indication were available before and after the autopilot disengaged the right EADI lost roll indication, horizon, pitch scale, and sky ground indications. That's so just saying like the EADI is like the electronic ADI. So like this, they lost the electronic when the screens turned off. And that was, but that was only on the right side. Because we've talked about before, these planes and these systems often have very much very, a bunch of redundancies. Uh -huh. Normally one system will feed the left side and a separate redundant system will feed the right side. They were messing with the right side and that's why the right side screens went off. But, but, so, but they still had the they still at the left side, and they had the ba the standby backup system. So it's not like oh, okay. So they had plenty. It's not even yeah. I, mean, it, I didn't I didn't realize they still had a whole their whole other system. They were just troubleshooting the, the number two system, the backup. Right. Well, it's well, not even that it's the backup. It's the one that feeds the right side. And I will say this isn't an excuse by any stretch of the imagination. But when one goes out, you don't know if the left one is giving you correct information right, it anymore. Might be not, you're, mm. Because. You, don't, you can't cross-check between the two. But what you would do in that case is you, you cross-check between the, the, the backup. The standby. The, the, the stand, that's right. the backup. Exactly. Okay. So that's, that's how you cross-check and make sure. Presumably, if they agree, great. If they disagree, then you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but they would have agreed, right? Yeah, I, I don't Probably. know definitively, but I, I believe they would have agreed. Again, I'm not trying to make excuses for them. Just saying like yeah, how yeah. Like the thought process could work. The pilots did not have sufficient knowledge of the aircraft system to quickly and appropriately troubleshoot the IRS problem they were facing. Their actions to rectify the problem resulted in a number of decision errors. The pilots consulted the appropriate section of the aircraft's quick reference handbook to attempt to resolve the IRS malfunction. However, they did not maintain straight and level constant airspeed flight after the IRS mode selector was switched to attitude in accordance with the QRH. 
The pilot selected attitude in the IRS, which disengaged the autopilot. After the autopilot disengaged and the aircraft rolled right and exceeded 35 degrees right bank, the pilots appeared to have become spatially disoriented. Both pilots became engrossed with troubleshooting the inertial reference system anomalies for at least the last 13 minutes of the flight with minimal regard to other flight requirements. Yeah. Awful. From about 6.58 and 40 seconds with a right bank angle of 100 degrees and approaching 60 degrees nose down, the pilots realized their critical situation and attempted to effect recovery by using inappropriate control inputs. Mm -hmm. A significant aerodynamic structural failure occurred at the time of the G-force reversal. The time of the recording of the thump-thump sound the thump-thump sound of the CVR was verified by spectrum analysis and determined to be typical of a structural failure. The aircraft broke apart. It's just scary. Yeah, I can't imagine the forces that were put on that plane and those people to cause the plane to break. There was no evidence of an in-flight fire. The aircraft impacted the water at high speed and a steep descent angle and disintegrated on impact. The Adam Air syllabus of training did not cover complete or partial IRS failure training. At the time of the accident, Adam Air did not provide their pilots with IRS malfunction corrective action training in the simulator, nor did they provide aircraft upset recovery training or proficiency checks. Uh, it's kind of what we, yeah. we talked about, uh, the upset recovery training. I, I, know, I know that training is, as unusual attitudes. <laughs> they, <laughs> it's probably much more advanced on a, on a big passenger jet. At the time of the accident, the Adam Air organization structure included a flight standard manager but his listed duties did not include responsibility for the aircraft operations manuals. So at the very beginning, we kind of, I, I kind of teased something at the intro where I said that Indonesian airlines were banned from flying to the oh. European Union because yeah. of this, this accident. Yeah. It's very fascinating. So this was in 2007. And I want to say that this ban was in effect until 2018. That's a long time. It's a long time. Because of this period of growth which we talked about in the indonesian aviation industry and this lack of a safety that resulted in several crashes in indonesia at that time the european union just closed its airspace to indonesian airlines wow uh saying that they weren't safe enough all of them mm -hmm. and they were not allowed to fly into european union airspace at all until they took corrective action and really redid their entire aviation industry to be more safety focused and to to stop these kinds of these kinds this of accidents is, is happening too often way to too often in fact adam air unsurprisingly went out of business uh, about a year after this they they lost their certificate that allowed them to operate an airline in indonesia and went because of this incident specifically or was it a comp i mean probably compounding and they had two other accidents after this crash. Oh my. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> between uh, Wait, this... Have we talked about... No, we never talked about Adam Air. Uh, two other? Yeah, on February, in February 2007, and then in March 2008, they had two other accidents. I don't believe anyone... Wait, so they had one, like, a month? One a less... year. One a year. Wait, wait, 2007? They had one in February 2007? Oh, yeah. They had one, like, less than a month? Yeah, so they had four total. February wait. 2006, January 2007, which is this okay. one. Okay. February 2007, what? which is a month later, and then March 2008, they, yeah, they, Adam Air was not allowed to, to, to fly anymore. If you can call that flying. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily this flight specifically, yeah. but they had two other accidents. <laughs> after of, this. Yeah, after this. And That's crazy. They, 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 they were no longer allowed to fly. It's awful. Uh, at least the best thing I can say is I don't think anybody died in the other accidents that they oh. had. The first one, like I said, in February 2006, where well, just the pilots got lost and landed at the wrong airport. Okay, yeah, that's not, that's what, an incident, not yeah, an accident? Right, exactly. The one February 2007, they had a hard landing, which caused the fuselage of the plane to crack and bend in the middle, which is a very hard landing. That's, yeah, but no one died. Right. Okay. And the one in March of 2008, a plane was landing and skidded off the end of the runway when landing. Okay. Uh, and everyone survived. Okay, I feel better now. When you're like, yeah, the plane's just dropping out. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, the fact that there weren't. But this was the only one with fatality. But you can see there's ongoing issues. And here. they didn't, they weren't fixing them. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, these kinds of things, I guess airlines having, how can I put, how can I put this delicately? Um, this isn't the only time. There, there have been other, other times when international aviation bodies have denied countries from flying in their airspace. From safety. Right. For example, here in the United States, the FAA got mad at Thai Airways back in 2015, citing some, some safety issues. And in order to fly in the United States, 
foreign airlines have to have what they call a Category 1 license. In 2015, the FAA found some problems with Thai Airways and changed their rating to Category 2. And what that does is they can continue to fly here, but they can't expand their operations until they fix the problems. Thai Airways just decided to stop flying to the United States. Oh, I used to see their planes at LAX every now and then. Uh, they just don't fly to the United States anymore. That's disconcerting. Well, they, I mean, they, they, I, I, it could also be they didn't have much business here. I think they only really ever flew to New York and Los Angeles at, before this. Uh, I think they probably, it probably was just a small part of their business. But yeah, so, and I think recently, maybe last year, or the year before, there were also some issues with the Mexican aviation industry. And I think that airlines based out of Mexico uh, are in that category too now, and they cannot expand their uh, operations in the United States. Oh, that one's got to hurt. We were supposed to have some new routes out of Austin. I think there was supposed to be like a new Austin to Monterey uh -huh. flight. In yeah, Mexico. I think I remember we talked about then, it. Yeah, and then they got downgraded to category two, and that so they couldn't expand their service since they hadn't started that leg they can't introduce oh. it so presumably they'll fix it and you know get whatever issues the faa sees uh resolved and and be able to get that category one license again it's probably one of those things most people never pay attention to but now that i've mentioned it you'll probably see it in the news every now and then <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll, it's something you'll be aware of now and you'll probably you'll probably yeah. pick up on but that's it for oh, adam air 574 oh did you have a question a couple questions all right the stuff going wrong with the plane mm -hmm. i mean you didn't mention any of that being as like at fault. It was more like training and stuff. The the navigational equipment going out. Mm -hmm. Is there is there fault there or is that just something that happens? There or? was there was poor maintenance with Adam Air. I believe the IRS this specific IRS breaking in this specific plane had been an ongoing issue mm -hmm. that maintenance would just kind of like take the IRS out, clean it off, take it back in and do a ground test and be like, "Yep, it's fixed. It's uh -huh. fine." It was just one of those recurring nagging issues that never fully got addressed. And I feel like we've talked yeah, about that, issues like this in the past where they shouldn't take down a plane. Right. But yeah, in the end, it's not like the plane couldn't fly. Yeah. And then the other thing I was wondering, the, the drift, mm -hmm. is that something that's like, I mean, all planes have a little bit of drift or should that have been taken care of or... It's negligible. I mean, it, it's, it's, I wouldn't say every plane necessarily has, again, I don't fly commercial <laughs> airliners, so I can't answer that definitively, but most planes have, you know, little quirks to them. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this one's going to pull a little this way, this one's going to pull a little that way. It's to be expected. It might be written up in like the notes or like the, mm -hmm. you know, the maintenance logs for it. And, you know, normally something like that, either the autopilot handles or, you know, if you're yeah. hand flying it, you notice it and just do corrective action on your own. Okay. Yeah. So those were, Things that were like should have been fixed or possibly could, but not it's major. Yeah, yeah you this, didn't it, mention it, them as like yeah, it should not have crashed the plane. Yeah, uh, um, for example, that the plane needing like five degrees of aileron input that had probably I bet that had been going on for years. I mm. bet it had been something that everyone just dealt with with that with that specific plane. Okay, not a, not a big deal. Even on those single engine planes like I fly, mm -hmm. they're all a little different. It's like, oh, this one likes to run hot. This one <laughs> climbs more than that one. Yeah. This one you know, the, like this one wants to pull this direction like. They're all a little different. They're not yeah. all exactly the same. But yeah, that's it for Adam Air 574. A plane crash that stopped Indonesia from flying to Europe for, what, like eight years? or No, no longer than that. Ten years or so. Ten or eleven years. That's wild. It's a long time. That's wild. But yeah, that's it. We'll be back next week with another episode. Don't, don't forget to follow us. Social media. Black yeah. Box Down Pod. Bye. Bye. <laughs>